Good evening. My name is John Duxworth. Um, I'm a graduate of the class of 1982, the inaugural class at Sing Sing Correction Facility, which was New York Theological's I don't want to use the word attempt, but was New York Theological Seminary's beginning of a, of a new era, introducing theological education into the uh, maximum security prison. In 1982, um, no other seminary had tried such a bold in, endeavor it's not, as a bold act of faith. Um, and I had the blessing and, and the opportunity to be in that inaugural class. Um, I am now the president of um, a group of men who have come home, who have traveled through the seminary, um, the North Campus Brotherhood. Uh, we are the second chartered member club, the chartered member group of New York Theological Seminary. And we still stay connected to the seminary and, and do the work. Um, even though we have come beyond uh, the walls of Sing Sing. But the work, the ministry is still very important. In my current role as the New York coordinator for a multi-phase uh, campaign initiative to end mass incarceration um, under the leadership of uh, several different major congregations here in the United States. Uh, my role as the coordinator of the New York uh, arm of that allows me to continue in doing the work. So I welcome you here tonight as we gather together to honor New York Theological Seminary, honor the work of Dr. Bill Weber, whom I had the opportunity of meeting um, in 1982 and who Bill was a major player in my own life from beginning in the 1982 and, and well up into the next seven or eight years. Um, not only while I was incarcerated, but post my release, um, Bill was a beacon of light. Bill was a beacon of hope. So it is what much pleasure that I'm able to be here this evening. And as we all gather together to open this, this wonderful, glorious time of celebration in a word of prayer. So please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of all of us being here today. Not only do we come to, together to honor the work of New York Theological Seminary, to honor the works of Dr. George William Weber. But we come here, Lord, to praise you, to celebrate your presence in our lives today, as well as in the life of New York Theological Seminary over a hundred years of work, over a hundred years of ministry. And yet, and we come to uplift the work, the marvelous work, the marvelous ministry of Dr. Weber. We give you thanks, Lord. We ask you to bless every word that is uplifted tonight. We ask you to bless every, every individual who is in the sound of our voices tonight. We ask you to continuously bless New York Theological Seminary. Bless every speaker here tonight and every speaker associated in this process. Even those who will never be in front of a camera, but the, the little ones, the ground, people on the ground. Bless each and every one, Lord. Anoint what's going to be said and anoint who it's going to be said to. In Jesus' name, amen.
My name is Tony Lin, and I am the Vice President of Institutional Advancement and Research at New York Theological Seminary. And I welcome you to the Weber Lecture, which this year is part of the 120th anniversary of the New York Theological Seminary. It is a testament to God's power and grace that we are here celebrating 120 years of what started as a small uh, Bible teacher's training college in the year 1900. And here we are again as New York Theological Seminary training faith and thought leaders to engage in relevant restorative and revolutionary ministries, um, not just in New York City, but around the world. I thank you for joining us. And I want to acknowledge that none of this would, be, would be possible without the support and friendship and prayer of, of you, our community, our larger community. So thank you. This is not just a celebration of New York Theological Seminary, but it's a celebration of, the, of, of your work and your support for, for this seminary. I want to encourage you to visit the website that you see on this uh, on your screen, 120gala.givesmart.com. On this website, you'll see a full schedule of events that we have planned for tomorrow and also Saturday, which will give you a glimpse of what the seminary has been up to in the past and what we are doing now, some of the work that, that we, are, we are engaging in. And I also want to direct you to the auction website. There are some wonderful items there for if you like love art or music. And especially for tonight, Dr. Eddie Gloud has graciously donated 10 of his uh, latest book, Begin Again, and he will personally sign them and inscribe them for the 10 winners. So please go, go and bid on this book. It's a fascinating and heart-wrenching yet hopeful book that, uh, that is ex extremely timely, timely for, uh, for our current moment. So enjoy the lecture. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you can enjoy us, uh, join us tomorrow when we, when we celebrate our gala with the Reverend Al Sharpton, as well as uh, some of our, our webinars on, on Saturday. Thank you for watching and, uh, and God bless.
called God's Colony in Man's World. She said, Dad, how could you ever write a book like that? How could you write a book with a title like that? Man's World? Man's World? It's a new day here. But one of the great things about my father was that he changed at the times. And he changed. Remember he told me once that he thought he had a calling to bring Christ to the streets of East Harlem. And when he got there, he found out that Christ had been there long since. And he didn't need, he didn't need to bring Christ to him. He said he learned more about faith from his congregation, congregation than he ever thought that. Uh, so he was 15 years a pastor at this East Harlem Protestant Parish. The great thing about the parish was that it had five or six churches. It had a group ministry where all the ministers together made group decisions. But it was involved in social justice. Everybody, lay people and ministers, had to be involved with some other calling. You had to be involved in narcotics addiction, education, health, housing, you name it. You had to spend at least half of your ministry out there on the streets working with the real needs of real people. And um, then he started the Metropolitan Urbis Training. He was in the building on 49th Street where the seminary was. And in 1968, Harold Medbo, who was the president of the New York Theological Seminary at that time, came to him and said, Bill, we can't find a new president. Nobody wants to take the job. We think you are the perfect man. He turned him down three times, or more. <laughs> uh, finally, he wrote, and this is in the book we you have here, he wrote a 10-page memo to the Board of Trustees, the students, and the faculty saying that if you were going to be the president, these are all the things that needed to happen in the theological seminary. And he came here and really changed it. They had 50 or 60 students who were about to close, and uh, he transformed the place by having a vision and bringing his spirit to the seminary. He, he loved this place, but just like the church, he believes that a seminary's impact is not in the halls of the academia. It's not in the halls of the name, it's out there in the world. Amen. Changing a lot of people. Yes, I'm waiting for a miracle. Yes, I'm praying that I hear from a God. Who I have to believe made us to be better than we've been behaving lately. I'm just reaching for a blessing, requesting a little help and answers to questions that maybe we should be asking ourselves. Like, can't we agree there's something wrong if I feel the need to scream my life matters and why in the world to you does that feel like an accusation? How many guns does one man need? How many children have to bleed and die before we concede? This math, it ain't had enough right, but I'm and 
answers on my TV. I saw a man who says he works for me. Then he offered a new brand of history. Told me not to believe what my own eyes see. I took to the streets to get the news. Got hit with about a million views, but 999,999. I was so afraid that they couldn't even hear what the first one said. Listen to a soft-spoken preacher teaching something different that is less about me and it's more about you. And he wept for a heart that was broken into it as his tears fell. They watered the roots of a tree that bore the most beautiful fruit. And he cried out begging the hungry to try it. But since it was free, nobody would buy it. I Theological Seminary's three-day virtual celebration of our 120th anniversary. Thank you so much um, for joining us on tonight, and we just want to give a special shout out to all of our students, our staff, our faculty, um, our board, our alumni, and certainly our friends. Um, as a part of our celebration, we are holding our annual Bill Weber Lecture. Um, and Bill Weber was a former uh, president at New York Theological Seminary um, who had a tremendous focus on activism and justice. And he really took those things to heart. Um, and so on tonight, we're so grateful um, to have as our Bill Weber lecturer, Dr. Eddie Glaude, uh, who certainly uh, is an intellectual uh, who speaks to the complex dynamics of the American experience. Um, you have seen him, you have heard his social and political commentary on MSNBC. Uh, his most well-known books, Democracy in Black, 
how race still enslaves the American soul and in a shade of blue, pragmatism and the politics of black America. Um, he is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton. He's a former president of the American Academy of Religion. We know that as AAR. And his books on religion and philosophy include An Uncommon Faith, a Pragmatic Approach to the Study of African American Religion, African American Religion, a sh very short introduction in Exodus, Religion, Race, and Nation Early in Early 19th Century Black America which was awarded the Modern Language Association's William Sanders Scarborough Book Prize. Um, Glaw's most recent book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own was released on June 30th, 2020. Uh, he is a Morehouse man, my Morehouse brother, and he <laughs> holds a master's degree in African-American studies from Temple University and a PhD in religion from Princeton University. And welcome, uh, Dr. Glaude. We are so grateful uh, to have you joining us on tonight. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know, uh, I'm holding on as best as I can, as my great grandmama used to say, yet holding on. Yeah, but, yet uh, holding <laughs> But we're doing well, Madam President. We're doing well. Excellent, excellent. So we're so grateful that you have um, agreed to participate in this uh, kind of prequel to your talk uh, on this evening. And so we've got to start by talking about your, your latest book, your most recent book, Begin Again, Jane Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. And so for me, I would consider James Baldwin to be a transcendent figure, right? So his words and his work are timeless. Uh, what compelled you or drew you to write um, this book? And how does Baldwin speak directly to our current social, political, and cultural climate that we're facing today? Well, you know, first of all, let me just say, let me say thank you for inviting me to be the Weber lecturer in this instance. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the New York Theological Seminary community for uh, all the work and, and extraordinary uh, prophetic voices that come out of uh, this historic space. And so I'm honored to be here with you in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Baldwin, for me, has been a walking partner for at least 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I was hesitant to, to approach him uh, in those early days because I knew what he would ask of me, uh, that, that Baldwin is this exacting companion insofar as he demands a kind of honesty with oneself, that you have to confront your own wounds, your own trauma, um, your own faults as a precondition to say anything about the world because Baldwin believes that the, the way the world looks is actually a reflection of the messiness of our interior lives. So you got to deal with you yeah. as you're dealing with the world. Um, so, you know, I've always, ever since that fateful time in graduate school when I decided to take him seriously, he's been a part of my thinking uh, in, in a shade of blue. He, uh, and every chapter except for the last one begins with an epigraph from Baldwin's work. Mm -hmm. uh, democracy in Black, Baldwin is everywhere in terms of the organization of the text, but he's, he's backstage. And so I decided to bring him forward, to kind of engage with him explicitly. And initially it was going to be a kind of intellectual biography, but I was so despairing and rageful about our current moment that I decided to, to write with him about our moment. And, and you know, to answer the latter part of the question, Baldwin, to my mind, lived through a moment of betrayal. He understood what it meant for the nation to turn its back on, on, on the black freedom struggle on all of those folk who sacrificed uh, uh, their spirit, their lives, their energy uh, to try to transform this democracy. He witnessed the country murder at Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm and, and, and Medgar. He saw uh, you know, the country turn to Richard Nixon and then finally Ronald Reagan. And the way in which he described the betrayal, which some people describe as a backlash, that's too easy. But the way in which he accounts for the betrayal, to my mind, offered me resources. And I think it offers us resources to understand this latest American fantasy, why the country reached for Trump in this moment. 
And so I decided to, as he would put it, I decided to make my way through the ruins and rubble of his work. And I found the book Begin Again. Wow, um, I, I certainly can can relate to that, and I can see that. I'm certainly um, during this season that we're in. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned um, the notion of witness, right, and and everything that he witnessed. Um, and you know, Baldwin certainly came to understand that the writer and the artist had a responsibility to bear witness, right? Yeah. Um, so, witness is actually a chapter in your book. So can you talk about the act of bearing witness and how it was critical to Baldwin's activism? You know, Baldwin says, you know, in an, in an essay he wrote for the New York Review of Books, New York Times Review of Books, book review, New York Times book review. Yeah, uh, in 1962 entitled, All As Much Truth As One Can Bear. Um, he has this line about, you know, the great, the great novelist simply has to tell the truth, to tell as much truth as one can bear and then a little more. Um, and so there's a sense in which the way in which he imagines the artist or the writer is in some ways in line with the romantics or Emerson's conception of the poet. It's not just someone who, 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 who engages in the craft of writing, right? It's someone who imagines the world and him or herself in expansive terms and tries to bring to bear a kind of imaginative description of that world mm -hmm. uh, in order to help us see ourselves in a clearer light, to understand ourselves better, to imagine ourselves differently. And so I think Baldwin understood that the role of the artist or the role of the poet was expansive. It wasn't narrow. And he grappled with what it meant to bear witness and what it meant to be on the front lines, mm -hmm. right? So in Witness, there's a moment where his first biographer, Fern Marja Ekman, um, uh, is interviewing him the day or two days after he, he, he left an action on the part of SNCC in Selma. And it's in that interview that Baldwin offered a definition of witness that haunts me. He says, no matter your, no, no matter your sense of loneliness, no matter your fears, you're called. You have to do something, you know, and, you, and then in that moment, what you have to do is make the suffering real. Make the suffering real, tell the story. And it's in that moment where he understood his role, uh, and and it helped me understand my own, that you know if we tell the truth, to tell as much truth as we can bear, and then more, mm -hmm. if we bear witness or make the suffering real, because these folk out here don't necessarily believe that what we're saying happen that's happening to us is real. So what does it mean to give a full account, to bring to bear the full weight of my skill set, of my imagination, to describe the circumstances of our living? And I think in the witness chapter, I'm trying to suggest that Baldwin understood that, but he, but he had to do it in, in the context of his own pain, in the context of his own sense of trauma. Right. We got to deal with our dead as we're bearing witness. Mm. Right. We got to deal with those who survived but survived broken while we're bearing witness. Um, and so that's what I was reaching for in that chapter and, and what I was reaching for in some ways in, in the entire book. Yeah, it's, that's, that's really a great notion of, of uh, telling the truth, right? And then going on to tell, tell a bit more truth. But it seems that, you know, in the times that we're living, that truth is really relative. It doesn't seem that our truth is always received. Um, what do you think is, is, the, is the real challenge behind um, us as individuals and us collectively as a nation in recognizing the, the truth of who we are? Why is that so, so difficult? Well, you know, I mean, if we if we if we tell the truth, right, that means that uh, particularly white Americans have to confront what they've done. Yeah. And you know, Baldwin would say over and over again that one of the most exhausting uh, uh, features of being black in this country is that we have to convince white folk that what's happening to us is real. Yeah. And if they can see that what's happening to us and what has happened to us is real, then they have to confront themselves. You see. At the heart of Baldwin's corpus is a revolutionary inversion. Mm -hmm. That the problem ain't us. Yeah. That at the heart of it is this conception of whiteness that leads to the belief that some people ought to be valued more because of the color of their skin than others. 
and how that belief then translates into dispositions and, and characters and how it evidences itself in our social, political and economic arrangements. So to tell the truth is to cut to the heart of the rot, to get to the heart of the rot of the place. And that's hard for human beings to do generally. And it's hard for folk who think that they're gonna lose everything because they cleave to this illusion, you see. And, and, it, and, it, and it boxes us in, it captures us, it, it keeps our feet firmly planted to this ground or to use another metaphor, we're permanently docked in the station because we refuse to, to encounter and to confront our ghastly failures. So the difficulty, uh, you know, let me put it this way, uh, Madam President, that, that um, how can I put this? America is often like, a, uh, like Never Never Land. And Never Never Land is populated by lost boys and lost girls who don't want to be responsible, who don't want to grow up, who don't want to be held accountable. So we're in a country that is, uh, that clings to its innocence because it refuses to grow up and we have to bear the burden of that. So folk don't want to hear it, but you got to tell the truth until you take your last breath. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that that never, never land analogy um, because it does fit perfectly, um, certainly with the challenges that we're facing around truth telling. Um, and I want to shift um, a little bit just because I want you to be able to speak to, to our students. Uh, many times, um, particularly when we're students, when we're younger, and we see folks that we believe have made it, you know, we're, we're seeing you on television, certainly uh, you have written several books, numerous books, um, serving as, you know, a professor, a distinguished professor at Princeton, um, and there are so many students that look and, and they see you in your glory, right? Mm, mm. Um, can you talk maybe about a challenge that you had to face along the way, um, just as a means of inspiration to students who sure. may be facing difficult times right now. Um, they see you and it just seems like you are, you know, um, so farther, uh, um, so far away, so far to reach, um, not able to see what their future might be. Maybe they could have imagined it before COVID and everything that we've seen in this last year, but for those students and not just our students, but those others who may be watching, who may be in the middle of, you know, a very challenging time, a difficult time. Can you talk about a challenging time that you've had um, and how you overcame that challenge? Wow, that's such, a, that's such an interesting, and, and great question. Um, first of all, let's just be clear. I'm a country boy from Moss Point, Mississippi. Right, my mother uh, cleaned toilets for a living. She was the supervisor of the janitorial crew at Ingalls Shipyard. Uh, didn't graduate high school, had her first baby in the ninth grade. Uh, my father uh, was a postman, a mailman. That's high cotton back in the day, um, but scared the hell out of me. I was afraid of him. He instilled fear in my gut. And so ever since I was a little boy, I've been trying to prove that I'm not a coward because he scared me so. So that, let's, let's be clear that, you know, oftentimes we think of folk who are in these spaces uh, as being born with silver spoons in their mouths. And, and you know, I come out of uh, uh, a space uh, that uh, 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 by any measure, I'm not supposed to be who I am, but 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 the but by the grace, right? So that's what we can say in that sense. A moment, you know, there's a moment in graduate school when I was in graduate school. There, there, you know, it was during the heyday of post-structuralism. You know, you guys are reading Fred Moten and all of these folks these days. That seems like old old stuff to me as I was reading, you know, Foucault and Derrida and all of these folks back in the day. Uh, when I first got to graduate school and I was trying my best to, to write like those folk. And I first, first started uh, working with Cornell West and, and, and I felt like I was floating in a black hole because I didn't have, I don't have Cornell West's memory. I hadn't been trained where I'd been exposed to all of this stuff. Morehouse educated me. It didn't expose me to everything. It just taught me how to read how to think. 
So you, I entered into this space at Princeton once I left Temple and you know, I had to deal with some things that there were gaps in my training and I had to make a decision whether or not I was gonna fold like wet tissue paper or whether or not I wasn't gonna sleep, right? So I had to get, I had to catch up, but in the process of catching up, I lost my voice. I found myself trying to imitate people. I tried, found myself trying to write like these post-structuralist folk that it didn't feel organic. And so I was lost floating, you know? And, and so I had to figure out a way to find the center of gravity. I had to recenter myself. And you know, you gotta have that, 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 that means, that mechanism that allows you to, to recenter because you're gonna lose your way. And so Juanita, who's my mama, is, is the way in which I recalibrate, right? That is, can, she, can my mama read this? Will my mother understand this? Does this sound like I'm new? Does this sound like me? Will she recognize that I'm trying to be truthful, right? So that's the way in which I recenter myself. So at that moment, when I found myself trying to imitate Cornell West, trying to imitate these folk on the page, I couldn't get it, I couldn't get the thoughts going. But when I found, when I recalibrated and tried to find my authentic voice, me, to know what I sound like on the page, to know what are the animating ideas that orient me to my scholarship. This is what I care about. And this is what I need in order to pursue what I care about. So, and then commit myself to the discipline of, 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 of filling in the gaps. Cornell told me something once when I was a young graduate student that I'll never forget. He said, if you don't, if you don't show up your foundation, Brother Eddie, you will spend your entire career trying to cover up the shoddiness of your foundation. Come on now, come on now. Yes. And, and so, so, you know, at that moment, you get you, you start developing the practices of reading, right? The, the discipline of reading deeply, understanding how your bibliography works. So to this day, whenever Cornell and I see each other, the first, almost the first words come out of our mouth after, after we ask about each other, and our families is what you read, what you're reading. So you got to get your reading habits up. But then in the background of this, Madam President, this is, I want to say this really quickly. You need to understand that the world conspires to make you small. Yeah. And the question you got to ask yourself is, will you be complicit? Mm. So in that moment, when you feel like you don't have the, like I felt like I didn't have it, Right, that I wasn't quite up to muster, that I didn't quite know who they were referencing and that I was kind of performing this and that, right? At that moment, you can shrink, you can hide, and then you become complicit in, in what the world is trying to do to you in the first place, right? But no, I'm Juanita's child. And what that means, what that means is that I have to have this expansive sense of myself. You understand? And I got to live true to that. And I got to live up to that because that crown has been above my head since the day I came on the, came in, came, came in on the planet, came into the world, you see. So I've been trying to live up into it, you know, grow into it. You see what I mean? I'm going on and on and on, but you get no, the point. That's, that's, that's good. And I think it's very helpful. Um, that authenticity, certainly, I think all of us end up struggling with that at some point or another. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I think that'll be very helpful to, to, to our students and certainly to those who are watching. Um, I guess my last question is, I'm so excited about this lecture. Um, the title of your lecture today is To Crush a Serpent, James yeah. Baldwin and the Crisis of Our Times. Why that title uh, during this time? You know, it's such an, it's, you know, I've been haunted by uh, Jimmy's ghosts uh, for a while. Um, and, you know, he's in my head. You know, I call him Jimmy for a reason. Um, and, you know, I'm, 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 I have a sense of myself that such that I didn't write a biography of him. I wanted to write with him. And what I do know is this, is that in the last days when cancer was ravaging his body, he was still thinking about, right, the, 
the country and its and its decisions and its choices. And in the last interview with Quincy Troop, he says, I was there. I know why they chose race. I was there. I know why they did everything that they've been doing, only because they, they have to be white to justify all the crimes that they've done. Mm. Right? This is Baldwin when cancer is ravaging his body, eating away at his throat. And to crush a serpent is the last essay, one of the last essays he wrote, and it's published in Playboy, and he's going after the moral majority. He's going after those white evangelicals who, who, have, who have, you know, snuggled up with Reagan and who have, who have sought, sought to sacralize a particular vision of power, a particular exercise of power, who are in some ways yoking the gospel, right, to a political vision that, right, despises the least of these. And in this extraordinary account of the Falwells and the Robertsons and the like, we, 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 we are living an echo as we see, right, white evangelicals and black evangelicals of a certain sort, right, claim the gospel in their support mm. of what we've experienced over the last four years. And so I wanted to go back to Baldwin's understanding of salvation in that moment. Mm -hmm. I want to keep going back to salvation is not about separation. Salvation, salvation is not about condemnation. Right. And Baldwin is talking about a form of salvation that has everything to do with right, uh, understanding the connection, the bridge between me and, and someone else, the bridge that is actually rooted in suffering, actually rooted in pain and actually uh, healed by love, you see. Mm. Right. Because the ethic at the heart of Baldwin's corpus, I think, is, is this, this notion that our suffering is the bridge that if I can kind of encounter my suffering and use that as a bridge to your suffering, then maybe the two of us together can work through our pain and we can help each other be otherwise. Yeah. Now that becomes the model for this broader uh, 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 prophecy to the nation. So, so salvation, remember, is not about separation. Suffering allows me to connect, to bridge the divide. It's not a salvation is not about condemnation. It's about love in this powerful sense, right? In the sense of being vulnerable, in the sense of being fragile, in the sense of being of being able to risk. So love is not just simply agape, it's philia, it's it's eros, right? It's all three bound together. So I wanted to reach for to crush a serpent in this moment to offer us a vision as Christians of what we need to be doing in this moment. I believe, and I'll say this, and I know I'm talking too much here, but I, I'll say this. Somebody needs to be looking at some Christians and saying they must be drunk. Yeah. Because to me, it looks like too many Christians out here are adjusted, too adjusted to this yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, we got, our, that spirit needs to show itself in the world in a much more disruptive way. Absolutely. It seems to me. But that's what I, that's why I reach for that title. Thank you so much. I am so excited um, to hear your lecture. I, I know that our NYTS family has been blessed uh, by this conversation. I just want to encourage everyone to get their own copy of your, of your book, uh, Begin Again. Um, so grateful that you have agreed to provide personalized signed copies for our auction. Um, so if you want a personalized signed copy from Dr. Glaub, we, we invite you uh, to check out our website. We are so excited. We are so thankful for you. And we bless you as you continue to do this amazing kingdom building work that you've been doing. And without further ado, Dr. Eddie Glaub. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I wanna to thank Dr. Warren for her invitation and I'm honored to be a part of this conversation with New York Theological Seminary. You know, we gather today against the backdrop of a nation on a knife's edge. The divisions within the country, white, black, rural, urban, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat are in full view. And it feels as if the institutions and norms of our democracy 
are collapsing right in front of our bloodshot eyes. We've experienced an imperial presidency out of control. The People's House, the House of Representatives, uh, been stymied by hyperpartisanship. The Senate has been broken. We've even, even witnessed the politicization of the military and the courts. But more important than that is that COVID-19 ravages the country. Americans die alone. And those who love them must grieve with the regret of not being able to say goodbye properly. The economy is in tatters. Millions are unemployed and hunger grips the nation, but the top 1% thrives. They are getting richer as death travels from door to door. You combine all of that with the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the police killing of Trayford Pillarin in Lafayette, Louisiana, the public lynching of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the murder of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, the death of Rashard Brooks in Atlanta, of Ahmaud Arbery, of Walter Wallace in Philadelphia. They call for an ambulance and they sent the police. And now his mother grieves. We've seen people in the streets and people continue to protest in the streets and they're you know, and they're protesting what has been obvious to many of us for generations that in this country, supposedly committed to the basic principles of democracy, the lives of black people are less valued than others. We face a moral reckoning, a fundamental challenge to what we mean by we the people, to how we conceive of being together. No election will answer that question. In a time where a global pandemic is killing people indiscriminately in this country, especially black and brown people where our economy has collapsed and those who have the luxury of working from home or who are making money hand over fist demand that some of us, the most vulnerable among us go back to work and serve them when people can't pay their bills, their rent, put food on the table and the planet is screaming because we are killing it we see folk, our folk, engaged in the haunting public ritual of black grief. We have to watch videos, videos over and over again of black death, of black suffering. All on a perpetual loop. And we hear the weeping of those who have lost loved ones at the hands of the police. And this is happening against the backdrop of a political season. The ghost of the country's racist past now haunt out in public, right? They hunt out in the open. Political partisanship in this country is firmly connected to deep racial divisions. We see this as politicians exploit white fear and grievance and resentment for their own political gain. And in the face of what has been by any measures a disastrous first term, we still saw a large number of Americans applaud applauding, applauding Donald Trump and his minions. In so many ways, the American idea is in trouble. We have too long told ourselves a story that secures our virtue and protects us from our vices. But today we confront the ugliness of who we are and that, and that ugliness isn't just about who occupies the White House or murderous police officers or loud racist screaming horrible things. And I have to remind you that this is it. it is actually the images of children in cages with mucus smeared shirts and soiled pants glaring back at us. It's parents separated from their children after risking everything to come here only because they believe in the idea. 545 children permanently separated, it seems, from their parents. That's evil. It is Oscar Ramirez and his 23-month-old baby or daughter. We have to call their names 
face down, washed up on the banks of our shores. All of this has happened, is happening in the name of the American idea. Now I sat down as this, all of this was unfolding and is unfolding. I found myself as I sat down struggling with despair. The country had done it again. It had betrayed us and the euphoria of the election of the first black president and the, the direct declarations that we had turned the corner was met, were met with the venom of Trump's presidency. And you know what, we've been here before, as I've said. We've had a chance to be otherwise and the nation doubled down on its ugliness. You think about the civil war and radical reconstruction, what historians call the second founding. And here we see the formation of the modern US nation state, the passage of the 13th amendment, which ended slavery, the 14th amendment, which you know, granted black folk citizenship, which untethered citizenship from the idea of whiteness, the 15th amendment, which gave black men the vote, right? We see all of this as part of the, found, the second founding, the formation of the modern US nation state. But all of this went along with the sedimentation of Jim Crow in the South. Frederick Douglass lived long enough to see Abraham Lincoln sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and he lived long enough to see hmm, the state of Mississippi pass the first Jim Crow laws. It's during this period that we see the conscription of black labor through policing. And, and, and criminal convict leasing that led to cities like Birmingham being built. It's during this period that we see the ideology of Anglo-Saxonism defining the value of white people over against all others of certain kinds of white people and justifying and, and in some ways serving as the motivational force for the imperial ambition of the US nation state as it moved out into the world the very moment in which the country was consolidating a racial regime in the South, was annexing places like the Philippines and bringing millions of black and brown people under its rule. America's export is not just simply baseball, it's white supremacy. And it's not just a Southern story either. At the moment in which we reached for a different way of being as a nation, to be a truly multiracial democracy. The country doubled down on its ugliness. It doubled down on the belief that white people mattered more than others. And the same thing happened in the mid 20th century. The black freedom struggle demanded broad-based inclusion and, and historians refer to this period as the second reconstruction, an attempt to make real the promises, the broken promises of the first. And what did we get in response? got calls for law and order, which put in place the cornerstone of what would become the carceral state. We got the tax revolt in California, which laid the foundation for the shredding of the social safety net, a wholesale attack on the basic fundamentals of the New Deal. We saw in 1968 and 72, the election of Richard Nixon designed to defend the so-called forgotten Americans, the so-called silent majority. And by 1980, we see the election of Ronald Reagan at the very moment in which the nation reached for a different way of being in the world, it doubled down on its ugliness. In 2008, Barack Obama was elected. And what did we get? We got the vitriol of the Tea Party, the voter ID laws and voter suppression, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. What did we get? We got the election of Donald Trump. At every turn, when we have faced the kind of moral reckoning we now face, we have doubled down on our ugliness. It is in light of this that I found myself struggling with despair and rage. And you know, when rage and despair mix, all hell can break loose. In the midst of struggling with my despair and rage, I reached for James Baldwin, for resources to help me understand how to pick up the pieces and, and how to continue to struggle in light of America's ongoing betrayal. Baldwin insisted that the country confront the lie that sustains its innocence. As he put it in The Fire Next Time, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime, a kind of willful ignorance that protects this lie about oneself. 
You know, Baldwin relentlessly exposed the lies that America told itself. And nothing personal, an essay he wrote in 1964 to accompany the photographs of Richard Avenden, Baldwin put the point succinctly, we are afraid to reveal ourselves because we trust ourselves so little. And in this labyrinth, the person is desperately trying not to find out what he really thinks. Therefore, the truth cannot be told even if one's, even about one's attitudes. He says, we live by lies. We live by lies. And not only, for example, about race, but also about our very natures. He says, the lie has penetrated our most private moments and the most secret chambers of our heart. This country has never been a beacon of virtue. The country has never been an example of democracy achieved. It's, it's not the shining city on the hill. We tell ourselves these lies in order to protect ourselves from what we have done. Baldwin understood that our problem in the United States went beyond who occupied the White House or the latest example of American racism. We had to get to the rot at the heart of the matter, he insisted. And this would require that we deconstruct all that the nation holds sacred, tell the truth so that we might be released into a different way of being in the world. Now, how do we keep fighting when the times seem so dark? How do we muster the energy and courage to keep pushing this damn boulder up the hill. Baldwin had to ask himself those questions. America consistently betraying us. Every generation having to grapple with the reality of having to bury our dead too soon. Every generation having to witness white America walk across our dead with no care or compunction, right? We have to deal with our own sorrow and pain. And now it's on loop. Videos that come back to haunt. Baldwin had to come to terms with what happened to the black freedom struggle in such a short period of time. He had to deal with the fact that they killed an apostle of love, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he lost it. He collapsed. In 1969, he tried to commit suicide. He was so vulnerable and so fragile, and he had to work hard to figure out the angry cries of Black power, to find language to describe the white fantasy that was Ronald Reagan. He had to tell the truth even as cancer ravaged his body. And here we are today where the forces unleashed by the latest version of the American fantasy and by those who cleave to the idea of being white and menaced by those who are not, that that fantasy threatened as it has always and as they have always done, it threatens to destroy the very foundation of the country. Baldwin responded to these moments with love. He insisted that love was the key. In an interview with Nazir uh, Bayoum in Istanbul in 1969 with black power blazing across the country and throughout the black diaspora, Jimmy's emphasis on love returned. He wrote, if only people, if only people could trust the thing, they would be a, they would be less afraid of being touched, less afraid of loving each other, less afraid of being changed by each other. Life would be different. Our children would not be the victims that they are now. We would not be either. But for some reason, love is the most frightful thing, he writes. Something that the human being is most in need of and dreads most. Now, this view of love remained consistent across the body of Baldwin's work. It was woven together with his rejection of categorization and its threat to overwhelm the complexity of who we actually are. Baldwin made the point explicitly in that same interview. He said, quote, like all poets, 
I am full with the question of how the human being will be put to the right. Isn't that beautiful? I am full with the question of how the human being will be put to the right. You know, it is for this reason that all this black, white, Armenian, Turkish, Greek, Jewish, et cetera, et cetera, never carried any meaning for me. The question is how to fix ourselves. The question is how to fix ourselves, give birth to ourselves to make us live free of all these swaddling clothes, free of all of these habits. Love becomes the crucible within which we reach for a different way of being together. And this we can see as early as 1963 with Baldwin's Fire Next Time, right? Remember that moment in Fire Next Time. He says, it is for this reason, because we're evading who we are. We don't want to confront the lie. We don't want to confront the lies that we tell ourselves. He says, it is for this reason that love is so desperately sought and so cunningly avoided. Love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. And he says, I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. Baldwin understood what love meant. And here, he's not just talking about agape. He's also talking about eros and, and philia, right? All three elements of the Greek understanding of love. Think about that moment at the end of Fire Next Time where he says, if we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must like lovers insist on to create the consciousness of the others do not falter in our duty now, we may be able handful that we are to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country. He says, like lovers, like lovers. What does he mean? That moment of vulnerability, that moment of being fragile, that moment in which we understand that we are in need of others, that moment when our suffering becomes the bridge to another's suffering, that moment when our pain allows us to be open to the pain of the world. And as we grapple with our suffering and pain, as we do so in love, we open up the possibility of being otherwise. But the precondition for all of this to happen is that you have to tell the truth about what you've done. You have to confront one's ghastly failures. And not only do you have to do that individually, but for Baldwin, you have to do that for the nation. The nation has to do it. Huh? In 1962, Baldwin published in the New York Times Book Review, an essay entitled As Much Truth As One Can Bear. The article was an extended meditation on the role of a new generation of writers among whom Baldwin was fast emerging as a leading voice. You know, he's thinking about Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Faulkner. These were writers that are sacrosanct, or still are actually sacrosanct and often served as a standard to judge the adequacy of the young generation of writers that past, the past full of these giants, Baldwin suggested, was used to bludgeon the present replete with those who inevitably fall short. Now, I mentioned this not to engage in an analysis of Baldwin's somewhat impious engagement with the American literary canon. Rather, it is what he says about the role of the artist. And here he echoes Emerson's view of the poet that strikes me as particularly relevant for our moment. Baldwin wrote, quote, the effort to become a great artist or a great novelist simply involves attempting to tell as much of the truth as one can bear, and then a little more. Mm. To tell as much of the truth as one can bear, and then a little more. We must, as Baldwin wrote, deal with what words hide and what they reveal. Now this is all the more important in a country like our own, where our stories obscure the horrors of what we've done and, and ensure our sense of innocence and inherent goodness. Telling the truth here 
especially in the dark times like our own, requires a certain kind of courage and commitment to shatter national illusions that offer safety and comfort and protect the order of things. It involves risking it all in moments like these in order to, what, release ourselves into a new way of being together. This will entail at times a withering criticism of the past that haunts and constrains a scathing critique of our self-conception. What am I trying to suggest here? Baldwin says that the American project is predicated upon lies. That we have told ourselves these lies about what we've done in order to protect our innocence. To keep us from confronting our ghastly failures. And what does that mean? That means that we have in some ways become monstrous in some ways. But how does he respond? He not only responds by telling the truth, telling as much truth as we can bear, but he also understands that we must tell that truth in love, right? A love rooted in our own suffering and pain because the suffering and pain becomes the bridge to others that allows both of us, right? In some ways to imagine ourselves differently. This is Baldwin's ethic, it seems to me. This is his moral stand. But it requires right, an unflinching honesty about who we are, about who and what white America, who and what these people take themselves to be. As Baldwin put it, quote, we live in a country in which words are mostly used to cover the sleep and not to waken it. And therefore, it seems to me the adulation so cruelly proffered our elders has nothing to do with their achievement, but has to do with our impulse to look back on what we imagine to have been a happier time. It is an adulation which has panic at the root. Baldwin is unsparing in his criticism. He goes on to say that, quote, one hears in the work of all of Americans, no, American novelists, even including the mighty Henry James, Songs of the Plains, the memory of a virgin continent, mysteriously despoiled, though all dreams were to have become possible here. This did not happen. And, and the panic then to which I've referred comes out of the fact that we are now confronting the awful question, the awful question of whether or not all of our dreams have failed. How have we managed to become what we have in fact become, he asks. And if we are indeed, as we seem to be so empty and desperate, what are we to do about it? This longing for a happier time, a kind of nostalgia, allows us to turn our heads away from the difficulty of our days. We want to make America great again, or we pine for the days before our current misery, as if America's loss of innocence is a recent event, or as if the issue is the loss of innocence at all. Baldwin insisted that we have to ask ourselves the hard questions that get us to the heart of the matter. How shall we put ourselves in touch with reality? How shall we put ourselves in touch with reality? He understood the pernicious effects of the lie on America's character, that the lie involved what we tell ourselves about black and white people, that white people ought to be valued more in this country than others. And he witnessed the monstrous consequences of what followed from this view in terms of our dispositions and practices. Baldwin insisted, and, and it is an insistence that we must follow if we are to survive our own darkness, that quote, we must, describe us to ourselves as we now are. Hmm. We must describe us to ourselves as we now are. Tell the truth. This formulation allows us to see the work of the poet in describing things as they are. We have to be poets. We have to bear witness. And we must do so in love. Now, America has to choose. We have to choose whether it will finally become, America has to choose, we have to choose whether we will finally become a genuinely multiracial democracy. And this involves grappling with the past that continues to haunt our present living. That George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Walter Wallace, these are simply the latest victims of the slave codes that have shaped the way black communities are policed in this country, that we have to tell the truth about the wealth gap and 
the achievement gap and the disparities in healthcare, that we have to tell the truth about who we are. As Baldwin wrote, quote, the trouble is deeper than we think. <laughs> I love this line. The trouble is deeper than we wish to think because the trouble is in us. And we will never, ever establish human communities, he writes. We will never establish human community until we stare our ghastly failure in the face, end quote. This is a challenge we all must take up. You know we all stand on a knife's edge. That the background conditions that make our world possible have cracked. We have to grapple in the aftermath of this election with the reality of our dead. Over 220,000 Americans dead. And our numbers, black folks and brown folks are disproportionately represented in that number. And many have had to die alone without loved ones holding their hand. As a nation, we're going to have to confront the reality of our dead because for the last four years, we have not, the last two years, the last year, over the month, over the span of this pandemic, we have turned in so many ways a blind eye, at least a blind national eye, to the reality of the suffering that's happening in our communities. Walt Whitman had to grapple with the dead of the Civil War. We have to grapple with our dead. We have to grapple with the loneliness that follows, the sense of regret that follows from the fact that we couldn't honor the life properly, that some couldn't sit ship, that we couldn't have the weight, we couldn't have the proper home, go home going, that the folks in New Orleans couldn't march the second line, that we couldn't say goodbye. So our grief is tinged with regret. And we have to grapple with uh, the reality of selfishness in this moment. Uh, uh, it has been revealed over the course of, of this pandemic, over the course of this crisis, that the country is in the grips of selfishness. And I'm reminded of this wonderful line that Bishop Curry uh, uh, said to me, and he writes in his book, The Way, the Way is Love, right? That is, that love, the opposite of love is not hatred. The opposite of love is selfishness. And we have been awash in selfishness. So much so that for a large percentage of Americans, that to put on one's mask, right, is somehow an infringement upon liberty. Oh, the trouble that we face is so much deeper than we think because the trouble is in us. We have to live our way into a different way of being together, a different way of doing our work together. That means committing ourselves to building a country that affirms the dignity and sacrality of every human being, no matter the color of their skin, their zip code, who they love, their gender or ability. It must involve a revolution of value, a shift in what and who we value must involve an ongoing and devastating, a scathing criticism of the very idea of white America. That idea isn't redeemable. There's nothing redeemable about the view that white people matter more than others, but that doesn't mean we are re irredeemable. In order for this to happen, we have to tell ourselves the truth about our failures, but we have to do so in love. We have to take the risk to do something bold and visionary. In the end, we all have been birthed in the American fantasy of itself as an example of democracy achieved. That fantasy has distorted and disfigured our moral sense because it requires that we lie to ourselves about what we've done. And the lie that thrives on a kind of willful ignorance makes this place, it makes us monstrous. I believe it is our task today to do exactly what Baldwin called for 
1962 and 1987. In 62, he wrote, quote, we have to mount an unending attack on all that Americans believe themselves to hold sacred. It is to unmask panic at the root. In some ways, the presidential election came at the right time, at a time of moral reckoning. But I pray that we do not trade one fantasy for another, that Trump's defeat will somehow affirm America's inherent goodness and put a grateful republic back to sleep. Presidential elections alone, no matter how momentous, do not settle the question of who we take ourselves to be. The answer to that question will emerge in what we do after November. Now we must, in this moment, we must risk everything, everything. America is broken. Young Americans know this. They've come of age and amid catastrophe and they know the country is fundamentally broken. Some reach for progressive politics, others turn to authoritarianism or fascism. They're reaching for languages that can help them make sense of what the American fantasy with its particular words have hidden and concealed. But Baldwin is right, he was right. Quote, our own record must be read. The record must be read. The air of this time and places so heavy with rhetoric, he writes, so thick with soothing lies that one must really do great violence to language. One must somehow disrupt the comforting beat in order to be heard. And this is particularly true for Christians particularly true in this moment that has revealed the hypocrisy of those who traffic in the gospel so that they can walk the corridors of power. Baldwin understood the hypocrisy at its root in the midst of him, of, of him grappling with the anger of black, pov, of black power, the devastation of the betrayal that was Ronald Reagan, he saw clearly who the moral majority was. He understood what it meant for these particular folk to sacralize power in the way that they did. And so he penned one of his last essays entitled To Crush a Serpent. Hmm. To Crush a Serpent. And there he challenged right, those who would in some ways embrace the gospel to live it in light of a, a robust conception of the sacrality of every human being. Because Jimmy understood that if we dared to create ourselves anew, we needed to do something unprecedented. And that was, and that is to create a self without the need for enemies, as he put it. Mm. I want to read a passage from to crush a serpent, because I think it's important to our moments and to your ministries. He says, salvation is not flight from the wrath of God. It is accepting and reciprocating the love of God. Salvation is not separation. It is the beginning of union with all that is or has been or will ever be those who want to scorn LGBTQ community, those who want to scorn black and brown folk, those who want to scorn uh, immigrant labor, those who want to scorn uh, black and brown people, those who want to scorn those folk who are different than them. They imagine God's love evidenced in separation. Baldwin says, salvation is not found there. Salvation is as real, as mighty, and as impersonal as the rain, he says, and it is yet as private as the rain in one's face. Salvation repudiates condemnation, he says, since we all have the right for many reasons to condemn one another. Condemnation is easier than wonder and obliterates the possibility of salvation. He says, I'm speaking as the historical victim of the flames meant to exercise the terrors of the mob 
and I'm also speaking as an actual potential vi victim, those ladders to fire, <laughs> the burning of the witch, the heretic, the Jew, the faggot, the N-word, have always failed to redeem or even to change in any way whatever the mob. They merely force their connection on the only plane on which the mob can meet the charred bones, connect its members and give them a reason to speak to one another. But the charred bones are the sum total of their individual self-hatred externalized. The burning or lynching or torturing gives them something to talk about. They dare no other subject, certainly not the forbidden subject of the bloodstained self. They dare not trust one another. End quote. He says, what we are witnessing, what we are watching with the Falwells and Robertsons is an attempt to exercise us into crush the into crush the serpent, right? Baldwin is trying to offer an understanding of love and salvation that frees us up from the categories that distort and disfigure the soul, that frees us up from this desire to scapegoat that leads to this unseemly death, these unseemly rituals, right? To, to in some ways consolidate a particular community that feels under threat. What does it mean to love in this moment? What does it mean to call out the hypocrisy of those who claim the gospel in this moment? It means to tell the truth as much as one could bear and a little bit more. It means to stand on the power of love in all of its complexity, not sentimentality. It means to risk everything in this moment, everything. Baldwin wrote that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Such powerful words for our country and for you, pastor, for you, educators, for you. We cannot stick our heads in the sand this time. We cannot tinker around the edges and leave the old frame intact. We must shake loose from the shibboleths of the past and their gods and begin again. No matter what has been done, no matter the death that shadows our steps, we cannot turn away from our responsibility right now. No matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in the White House, we have some fundamental work to do. As Baldwin put it in just above my head, responsibility isn't lost, it's abdicated. And if one refuses abdication, then one begins again. Let's begin again right here, right now. Let's risk everything to finally put the sin of racism behind us and figure out how to be together differently. Let's understand what Baldwin meant by salvation into crush a serpent. This is going to require something extraordinary from us. It's gonna require white America to rid itself of the insidious belief that they ought to be valued more than others. And that will be hard work. It's going to require us to be courageous in resisting it all. But as Baldwin says, human beings are at once miracles and disasters. I love that. We are at once miracles and disasters. If we show up, if we risk ourselves in this moment, we at least have a chance. For a miracle. We at least have a chance for a miracle. Take care. I appreciate you. I don't think there was any institution or program closer to my father's heart the New York Theological Seminary, uh, especially at this time in our history with such 
racial divide with such tension, with such also opportunity to really make a change in this world. We need NYTS more than ever. Uh, Dad would have wanted this program to continue. And I think under Lakeisha Walren's presidency, it's going to get deeper. It's going to get stronger. It's going to influence and impact on more people, on more communities. And I would only ask everyone listening out there today, everyone watching this, go to nyts.edu and make a contribution, make a donation of whatever size, so that this incredible work, this transformative work, this redemptive revolutionary work uh, can continue. Uh, it would be the greatest legacy for my family, for my father, Bill, uh, if we could continue and if NYTS could prosper and become even more impactful in the world as we proceed forward. So again, please go to nyts.edu and make a sizable contribution. Good night, everyone. My name is Tamara Henry, and I serve as the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Academic Dean at New York Theological Seminary. Just want to say a word of thanks for participating in tonight's very special Weber Lecture with our dynamic presenter, uh, Dr. Eddie Glaude. Tonight's lecture, of course, is part of our 120th anniversary celebration and virtual fundraiser. And just a reminder that the celebration continues tomorrow night with our feature speaker, Reverend Al Sharpton. So be sure to tune in then. Just before we get ready to go, want to offer a quick word of prayer. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we ask you tonight as we prepare to leave this place to inspire us anew as leaders uh, to do the good work that you've called us to do. Grant us, as we've been reminded tonight, courage to be revolutionary in this hour. Empower us to be strong and not stagnant in our faith. And dear God, whenever we are tempted to shrink back, embolden us once again to seek and to speak your truth. Amen. Have a great rest of evening, everyone. See you tomorrow night.